So we have our final lecture uh, today, which is going to be given to us by Dr. Aaron Lewis. Um, it is entitled Preimplantation Genetic Testing for Aneuploidy. Is it needed for all patients pursuing IVF? So Dr. Lewis completed her undergraduate at Yale, followed by um, getting her MD at Boston University School of Medicine, and then she completed her OBGYN residency at UCLA, and then REI fellowship at the Brigham. She has conducted research on societal views on uh, fertility preservation. She's also investigated the impact of fibroids on fertility and the best methods for fibroid removal prior to fertility treatments. She has served as an educator at Harvard School of Medicine's Core Clerkship Seminar Series. Please welcome Dr. Lewis. All right, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for staying. I know it's, it's hard. There's checkout at 12 p.m., but <laughs> hopefully this will um, be an interesting talk. Um, so I have no conflict of interest to disclose. The objectives of my talk are to review the fundamentals of PGTA, to discuss recent literature analyzing IVF outcomes with PGTA, to review the mosaic embryos and how to interpret these results and to address prenatal testing recommendations for patients using PGTA-tested embryos. So just a little bit about the fundamentals of PGTA. So it was designed as an early form of prenatal diagnosis to improve IVF success rates. So it's a selection process. We're trying to identify normal embryos versus abnormal. Normal is euploid, the correct number of chromosomes. And abnormal is aneuploid, incorrect number of chromosomes. So just a little bit about PGTA use in the US. It has grown dramatically. This is one study from Journal of Assisted um, JARG um, in 2021 that basically looked at SARC data from 2014 to 2017. But by 2017, 32% of all IVF cycles utilized PGTA, and that number is probably much higher now in 2022. Um, in 2016, 11.4% of clinics were using PGTA in greater than 50% of cycles. And then just a year later, it doubled. 22% of, cl of clinics were using PGTA for greater than 50% of cycles. The states with the highest rates of PGTA, New Mexico, Delaware, Mississippi, California, and Oregon. And some of that is related to insurance coverage. Um, and I'm sure that's changing as well um, if we were to assess things in 2022. So what is PGTA? Um, PGTA now is a, a, a biopsy of the blastocyst. And so this is a schema of the development of, a, of an embryo. On day zero, that's when we do an egg retrieval um, prior to fertilization. That's when we fertilize those embryos. On day one, you should have two cells. By day three, there should be eight cells. Between day three and day five, a lot happens. Compaction, internalization, lumen formation. Um, and by blastocyst stage, there's two sets of cells. There's the inner cell mass that makes up the fetal cells and the trophectoderm that makes up the placenta. And current PGTA utilizes a five to 10 uh, cell biopsy of the trophectoderm. Okay, so this is uh, just a schema of that. And you can see the inner cell mass very clearly. The trophectoderm is around um, the embryo. This is uh, just a depiction of what happens during a trophectoderm biopsy. Uh, the first picture A is looking at an expanded blastocyst or hatching blastocyst. Um, you can actually see the embryo hatching out of the shell, which is called the zona pellucida um, of that embryo. In B, you can see a close-up of that trophectoderm. In C, you start to see a pipel kind of trying to grab some of those cells of the trophectoderm. And then um, in D, you can see quite a few of those cells going into the pipel. Um, and in E, you see an attenuation. So we're trying to break up those five to 10 cells from the rest of the trophectoderm. Actually, the embryologist will use laser in a um, pulsatile fraction, uh, you know, uh, basically perpendicular so that we're not damaging the embryo at all. And then the last 
um, picture there F, you can see the biopsy on the right side, and then you see the embryo on the left. So why perform PGTA? Obviously, it's a selection criteria. We're trying to find those embryos that are normal so that we have better success rates for our patients. They go through less treatment, et cetera. Um, and we know that aneuploidy obviously increases with age. This is a really nice study done in 2014, which looked at 15,169 PGTA biopsies and revealed the lowest risk of aneuploidy was mid to late 20s relative to younger and older women. And then the second graph B there is looking at a uh, rate of no euploid embryos. And again, it was low between 26 and 37 and then rose younger to older age. Now, some of you might be wondering why are the younger ages here have a higher rate of, of aneuploidy, like 21, 22. These are patients who are going through PGTA, and a lot of those patients, young patients, were going through PGTM. They were testing for monogenic diseases in this specific, specific population, such as cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia. So it's, I think it's a skewed representation. As you know, we use a lot of donor egg. We have young patients, 21, 22, and excellent success rates. So I think the main focus of this is that aneuploidy increases with age, and we identify that with PGTA and then also the rate of having no normal embryos also increases with age. So just a little bit about the development of PGTA. We've been trying to do this for 30 years. It hasn't really been that successful in the initial, you know, um, you know uh, beginnings of this, uh, this research. Um, so the first way we were trying to do this with, was with fish, uh, Florensis in situ hybridization in 1993. We had very few data points. We had like seven data points. We were looking at chromosome 13, 18, 21 sex chromosomes, um, but we weren't getting a full picture of the whole embryo. Um, it wasn't until 1999 when we started using comparative uh, genomic hybridization that we started looking at all 24 chromosomes. And then we started looking at array CGH, um, and that happened in 2008, and we had a lot more data points, about 3,000. And then NGS came on board and, and next generation sequencing, and that's what a lot of the clinics use now in terms of PGTA testing. We have about uh, 0.5 million data points. In addition, we started in the early stages of PGTA testing, testing um, day three embryos, and we didn't really have blastocyst culture really perfected yet, or day five, day six uh, culture perfected, and we were taking one cell. That's a huge amount of that embryo, so it's like one eighth. So there should be about eight cells on day three, um, and we had a yes or no result. <laughs> now, with trophectoderm biopsy, we take about five to ten cells. We have a multicellular analysis. We also have this, this new outcome of using more data points of mosaicism, which I'll address a little bit later in the talk. So big question I have from patients all the time, is PGTA harmful to the embryo? Um, and it depends on the day of the biopsy. So as I talked about before, day three or cleavage stage embryo, you know, we, we took a huge portion of that embryo. Um, the trophectoderm, by the blastocyst stage, there's about 120 cells at that point. So we're just taking a sample of the placenta. Um, and so there was a really nice study done in 2013 um, that looked at, found that actually day three biopsy was harmful, so we really don't do it anymore. Sustained implantation was significantly reduced with day three biopsy compared with its non-biopsied control sibling, whereas we didn't see that um, with trophectoderm biopsy. Okay, so this kind of paved the way that we really needed to start doing blastocyst biopsy for patients. Um, I wanted to kind of focus a little bit more on NGS because if you have patients who've had PGTA on their embryos, most likely they used NGS technology. Um, so a little bit about the science behind it. It's a little bit confusing, um, and, you know, but wanted to just briefly talk about how we go about this. So it involves fragmenting amplified embryonic DNA into small fragments, 100 to 200 base pairs. Then the fragments are sequenced in parallel until sequencing depth is achieved, and then the data from the chromosomes are compared to a reference genome, which obviously would be normal, 46XX or 46XY. Um, why do we use PGTA now? I think we just get a lot more information. Um, we find out at aneuploidy about meiotic and postmeiotic errors after fertilization, segmental aneuploidy. So what if a segment of the, uh, the chromosome is missing, a P or a Q? portion of that chromosome. 
um, unbalanced translocations, polyploidy, which is triploidy, um, and mosaicism. This is just a report, a sample report of what we get as physicians or fertility physicians when we get the PGTA results back. We obviously, the highlighted ones are normal. We find out kind of what chromosome is affected. Um, those are obviously abnormal. And then you also see a mosaic abnormal there. And you also see with the mosaic, we report low or high. Um, and I'll get more into kind of mosaicism a little bit later in the talk, but how many of the cells are abnormal compared to normal? And we have different ways of rating low versus high mosaicism. So this is the raw data. I don't look at this, but this is what kind of the, you know, the uh, companies who do testing for PGTA will get. Um, this is normal 46XX and 46XY, and there should be two copy numbers, which the copy number is on the y-axis, the chromosome um, number is on the x-axis. You can see if with 46XY, there's one X chromosome, so that highlights there. Um, and these are some examples of aneuploidy. Um, so we're looking at monosomy 9 in the first graph here, um, and we see that there is one copy of chromosome 9 instead of 2, whereas everything else has 2. And then the second graph has monosomy 7 and 18, right? So only one copy of 7 and 18. And then trisomy 16, we see three copies of 16. Um, these are very clear graphs. Again, mosaicism is going to be a little bit different, but this is a diagnosis of aneuploidy for both of these embryos. I wanted to spend some time just talking about the literature um, about IVF outcomes with PGTA. There's a lot of studies. The SRM guideline about PGTA is a little bit ambiguous, saying we don't have the sufficient evidence to recommend it for everyone. But I wanted to talk about specific things that we do know some from, from some very good studies that have been done recently. Um, one is the move to elective single embryo transfer with the use of PGTA, and then also looking at obstetric neonatal outcomes. Second is looking at age and prognosis. Should that impact kind of who does PGTA or not, miscarriage rate, and also cost effectiveness. So, um, this was a really nice study done in 2014, um, and it's called the BEST trial. It was published in AJOG. And it was looking at blastocyst euploid selective transfer trial, and 175 patients were randomized to an elective single embryo transfer versus double embryo transfer untested. Um, and the cumulative delivery rate was no different between the two groups. It was not statistically different, 68% for the um, euploid ESET. And then uh, for the two embryo non-tested, it was 72%. What was more interesting is that we found that the neonatal obstetric outcomes were actually much better for the ESET, elective single embryo transfer. Um, no surprise there because we're, you know, you know, singleton pregnancy, but the risk of NICU admission was significantly higher after the untested double embryo transfer. Newborns spent more time in the NICU. Also, risk of low birth rate, um, you know, less than 2,500 grams was statistically significant, um, it, you know, higher in the untested double embryo transfer group. And I think this is important. We have a lot more data also in more recent studies is that patients ask me all the time, does PGTA harm the embryo? What are our outcome data with these euploid embryos? Do, do babies have side effects from this biopsy, right? Um, and we have really good data to show that this is safe. Also, this study and other studies really paved the way for single embryo transfer, improving um, obstetric outcomes for our patients. In the early days of IVF, we didn't have this ability to select embryos. We we're putting a lot of embryos in and having high multiple rate. Still something we deal with sometimes, obviously, um, in fertility medicine, but um, we're really trying to improve that. Um, I wanted to spend some time look, uh, looking at specific groups that might benefit or not benefit from PGTA. So this was a study done in 2019. It's called the STAR study. It was a huge study, really well designed. Um, it was a randomized control trial um, where patients were recruited from 34 clinics, and then they were tested in nine labs across the US. So it wasn't just one lab doing the testing and one set of patients. Um, the inclusion criteria was basically good prognosis patients, female ages 25 to 40 who underwent IVF with at least two blastocysts. If anyone has gone through IVF or have patients who go through IVF, it's hard to get two blastocysts sometimes. Um, and in addition, 
There was an exclusion criteria, diminished ovarian reserve, two prior failed IVF cycles, greater than one miscarriage, azospermia, severe oligospermia. So we're kind of getting rid of all those patients that would have a poor prognosis. The primary study outcome was ongoing pregnancy rate. And what the study found, surprisingly, was that there was no difference in ongoing pregnancy rate at 20 weeks between the PGTA and morphologically selected embryos. So in this group, they randomly selected for a single frozen embryo transfer, a genetically tested normal embryo versus an embryologist who chooses the best looking embryo. So they're looking at cellularity, development of the embryo, symmetry. Um, and so this was kind of surprising to a lot of patients and, uh, you know, and also for physicians who were really proponents of PGTA. Um, there was a post hoc subgroup analysis that revealed a higher ongoing pregnancy rate for older women, 35 to 40, but then it was not statistically significant when um, analyzed for intention to treat. So it's a little bit of a question mark um, for those older patients, um, would they benefit or not? There's another recent study done, also pretty large study, that was actually published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2021. And when I first read the byline for this, I was shocked <laughs> because basically they did the same study, but they were looking at cumulative live birth rate and they were comparing PGTA selected embryos versus morphologically selected embryos or conventional IVF. And they found a higher cumulative live birth rate with those conventional IVF um, group and also a higher cumulative live birth rate. Okay, so again, this was good prognosis patients. Average age was 29. The average number of blastocysts these patients had was seven, which is huge. I mean, if anyone going through IVF, seven embryos, you know, is, is a lot. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Again, assessing is if PGTA is needed for these good prognosis patients. I think there's some limitations to this study, um, and I'll kind of go through that. So they limited the genetic testing to just three embryos out of all the patients. So tested. So of those patients that had seven embryos, only three were biopsied. That's not typically how we do genetic testing of embryos. We typically biopsy all of them up to a certain amount. Um, it's more expensive for patients, but um, what if those patients had three embryos and only one out of those three were normal? What about those other four embryos? They weren't tested at part of this study. So I think that's a limitation. The other thing too is that the reason why we do PGTA is to improve pregnancy per transfer, not cumulative live birth rate. If you look in the supplemental data of this study, um, you see that the live birth rate per transfer actually favored PGTA, and it was statistically significant, 65% over 59%. More women in the conventional IVF group had a second and third transfer. That also speaks to that, you know, we want to improve per embryo transfer. We don't want patients to do three embryo transfers and go through failures and things like that. The other thing that I think is significant is that clinical miscarriage rate was statistically significant with this conventional IVF group, 12.6 um, versus 8.7%. Well, that might not mean much to a lot of people. You know, it's not that much different. It was statistically significant. But what if we were testing women who were 38 average age? That miscarriage rate we know would be higher, um, you know, um, with the conventional IVF group just because Unfortunately, we see more miscarriages as women get older. Wanted to spend some time talking about cost analysis. There's not a lot of coverage for IVF or fertility treatment in Georgia, um, and a lot of my patients struggle. I'm new to Georgia. I moved from California, so it's a very different um, patient population as well as insurance coverage. And so, you know, these are, um, I will just present a couple studies in why sometimes we recommend PGTA for patients. So this was a theoretical model, but a very nice graph demonstrating that greater than or equal to 36 years old was the age threshold where PGTA was more cost effective. And then if you're 35 with three or more embryos, PGD, PGTA also became more cost effective. Less than 35, um, it's probably more expensive to do PGTA and not really worth that benefit. And then this study was, um, you know, published in 2021 in AJOG. It was a really great study looking at SART data, a lot of data, um, 158,665 IVF cycles. Um, and they found that age 35 to 38, the cost per live birth favored no PGTA, and then over 39 favored PGTA. And so really, I talk to my patients about PGTA. There's not, you know, there's a lot of 
questions about it should we be doing it for everyone but I do give them this data that's very clear that it is cost effective there's been a lot more studies other than the two I've highlighted here to show that potentially for older women you're going to be paying less money because you're not going to be going through three transfers but just one transfer so a little bit just about the IVF outcomes in summary. So we saw that euploid ESET had similar live birth rate as a double embryo transfer untested, um, resulting in less low birth weight babies, as well as NICU admissions. The STAR study w showed no significant difference in overall pregnancy rates between morphologically versus PGTA selected embryos in young good prognosis patients. The New England Journal of Medicine affirmed that, but they looked at cumulative live birth rate again um, I, I discussed the limitations of that study. And then um, PGTA has been found to be cost effective in older women. I wanted to spend some time talking about mosaicism. Um, as OB providers, you might have had patients who had mosaic embryos transferred. And it's an emerging kind of thing that we're going to be seeing more and more because we are not discounting these mosaic embryos. I wanted to show you the schema of just what mosaicism is, and it's coexistence of cells with different chromosomal content. Um, low levels of mosaicism in prenatal specimens kind of bring up the question, does the placenta kind of autocorrect? Does it get rid of those cells that are abnormal? Um, because we don't really see a high rate of placental mosaicism as much as we do with this NGS testing. Um, and so you can see that we only biopsy 5 to 10 cells of the trophectoderm. What if we're getting a component of that trophectoderm that doesn't have ab you know, abnormal cells and we're missing that? So it could be a sampling error. Um, but these are just kind of some pictures of just what we think mosaicism looks like. Um, you know, when I first started fellowship, I think in 2014, um, Everyone was scared about mosaicism. It's like, it's an abnormal embryo. Why would you transfer it? There's a lot of liability. We're putting in kind of abnormal embryos. And then a New England Journal of Medicine reported um, just a case study in 2015 where mosaic embryos were transferred and resulted in healthy live births with documented normal karyotype at birth. Um, out of 18 transfers, there were eight pregnancies, six live births. And so I think this really called into question, should we be discarding these embryos? What if patients only have mosaic embryos? Um, are we getting rid of embryos that potentially could be live births? And we have transferred a lot more mosaic embryos. So this is one study looking from 2015 to 2020, looked at 1,000 mosaic embryo transfers uh, compared to 5,561 euploid embryo transfers. The overall incidence of mosaic embryos was 11 to 25.7 percent, but you can see that you know, these patients were getting pregnant, although not as uh, high of a rate as euploid. Euploid rate was 52.3%. Um, and then also you can see on the left column the different criteria for mosaics. So I talked a little about, about segmental. So maybe just half of the chromosome is abnormal or test abnormal um, versus a whole chromosome. How many chromosomes are testing abnormal? Um, and high com complex, for instance, would be the worst. It's more than two abnormal uh, chromosomes. And so we saw that ongoing pregnancy rate for those patients was 13.2%. Miscarriage risk was pretty high, 44.6, or sorry, 44%. Um, again, this is retrospective data. These are patients who had mosaic embryos, so they are poor prognosis patients, right? So we always transfer the euploid over mosaics, but I think it just makes it different. We shouldn't discount these. Um, this is from the same study, just looking at the data in a little bit of a different way. Obviously, euploid embryos had higher implantation ongoing pregnancy rate um, and less spontaneous abortion. And then um, all, overall, all mosaic embryos had a little bit less success with implantation, overall pregnancy, and higher miscarriage rate. And then those embryos with a whole chromosome abnormality that was showed to be mosaic had kind of the worst pregnancy rates and the higher rate of miscarriage. So we have to counsel patients about that. Um, in terms of definitions of low mosaicism and high mosaicism, it's a debate. Um, you know, right now, what most studies are looking at is the classification of a mosaic is when a copy number counts uh, we're in the 20 to 80 percent range between monosomy, disomy, and disomy, trisomy. Embryos with less than 20 percent mosaicism classified as euploid, greater than 80 percent classified as aneuploid. 
So this is a, um, a really nice diagram from um, PGDIS position statement in 2021, what to do about transfer of embryos. And you can see the more mosaicism, the higher level of mosaicism, you have decreased pregnancy rate, implantation rate, increased miscarriage rate. As you get closer to euploid, it gets better. <laughs> okay, so again, we always transfer those euploid embryos first, but I think this also this position statement came out and said a high proportion of mosaic embryos have developmental competence and should not be disregarded. And the risk of abnormal birth is pretty low, but transfer fa failures as well as SAB rate does increase. Wanted to just bring up a New York Times article that came out in, I think, April 2022. Um, and it, you know, New York Times is interesting what they pick up in terms of medical literature, but this is kind of you know, a lot of patients did talk to me about this article. Study raises question about popular genetic tests for abnormal embryos. And so it was highlighting a study that was done, a prospective cohort study where they were transferring abnormal embryos. There were actually eight live births. Um, 50 patients underwent a transfer and the embryos had one to two chromosome abnormalities or more than three. And then nine of them were no call, meaning there was no read um, that we didn't have a test result from the NGS testing or array CGH. And so that happens sometimes. We still transfer those, but some clinics decide not to. And so, again, it just breaks the question, is PGTA hurting some patients? Are we discarding potentially live births? I think more research needs to be done with this. There was a better study done um, in 2021 where um, it was a multi-center perspective blinded non-selection study where NGS PGTA was able to 100% accurately diagnose aneuploid pregnancies. Okay, so these are patients who went through the transfer not knowing the results of the genetic testing. Um, and 40.2% of patients actually had a positive HCG level, but then 23.5% went on to have a clinical loss and there were no sustained ongoing pregnancies. So I think the technology is pretty good. At our center at Reproductive Biology Associates, we don't transfer any poid embryos. I don't know of any other place in Atlanta that does that. I know that there's more centers, more academic centers that are studying this and, and willing to transfer any poid. Um, so I think we still have to wait for that data to come back. So I just wanted to, last thing I wanted to talk about is what do we do with these patients when we send them back to the OBs? What type of prenatal screening and diagnosis? Per the recommendations of ACOG in 2020, all of these patients should be offered um, diagnostic testing with CVS or amniocentesis. This should be a conversation because PGTA is not perfect. As I tell patients, it's a screening test. It's not a microarray. We can't pick up small deletions, duplications, imprinting disorders, all of these things. So I always tell patients when they graduate and move on to their OB that we still don't know. You know, uh, you still need to go through all the same screening. If you're, it's a 40-year-old woman, treat this like a normal pregnancy with all the same risks. And so they have to go through screening. They should be offered diagnostic testing. If patients elect for screening tests that are non-invasive, they should be aware of the limitations of that testing, false positives, et cetera. Um, and then mosaic embryos. That's a whole other ball game when we transfer those um, patients back to their OB. Um, first of all, most patients who have a mosaic embryo transfer have to go through very thorough genetic counseling before we transfer them. Um, and the reason is, is because there's a high risk of miscarriage rate and there have been live births with placental mosaicism um, causing fetal growth restriction, um, other kind of minor developmental delays that they should be aware of. Um, and so the recommendation really for those patients is amniocentesis and not CVS because amniocentesis is the most representative of the chromosomal complement of the fetus and CVS would be placental evaluation, which we don't want. We want to know what's, what's going on with the fetus. So if patients decline amniocentesis, you can offer 25, 24 chromosome NIPT. I know that's controversial, but it's better than just doing the regular NIPT, checking for four chromosomes. You want to make sure that they're screened for that chromosome that tested mosaic on their PGTA testing. All right, so summary, two large recent randomized control um, trials have really called in the question and utility of PGTA in young good prognosis patients. So that's kind of the question, that's what I struggle with in my counseling of patients. 
a 32-year-old with slight male factor infertility, does she really, and who's going to AMH level of six, she's going to have 15 embryos, do we really need to test all of those? Um, especially if she's paying out of pocket for everything, it costs about $5,000 more. Um, so I think these are questions that, um, you know, I think every um, IVF physician is kind of struggling with. RCTs are needed for uh, poor prognosis patients to see if the same findings apply. There are some, but they were done with day three embryo transfers and they were about 10 years ago, so we need more studies. Um, studies have demonstrated PGTA is cost effective for older women, so I do recommend that. Um, mosaic embryos have developmental potential and we can't discard them, especially if patients have nothing left, <laughs> okay? They go through other cycles and they can't get more euploid embryos or they just can't get any embryos. Um, PGTA is not perfect. Clinicians must counsel patients and prenatal testing is recommended despite this pre-implantation testing. Okay. All right. These are my references. Thank you. I know and the last talk of the day, so thanks for staying. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, first of all, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, it's not anything tough. Yeah. First of all, Great talk, Erin. That's a tough one. And for those who didn't stick around, they missed a, a good bit of information because we get asked this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, you hit on all the right points. And really, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it for the, for the audience, which is in light of the, uh, ev uh, of the change in our law now with Roe v. Wade, do you think we'll be doing more PGS testing on our patients for that reason? I do think so. I think Down syndrome for patients is a real scary thing. Um, you know, it's a baby that's medically complicated and has a lot of lifelong problems. Um, now, most T21 babies miscarry, actually. It's one of the more common chromosomes that we find on, um, you know, products of conception samples. But um, I personally have had a lot of patients um, ask about Roe v. Wade, even break down crying in our telemedicine consults because they're so worried about this. Um, and even young patients are doing PGTA because they don't want that risk. Even though the data in these large randomized control trials tell us that it's not really going to improve your life birth rate significantly, I think people are just afraid. Um, they want a healthy baby. So um, I think we're going to see more of it and, you know, um, hopefully insurance will cover it. You know, so it's not, we don't have to worry about that cost for patients. So. Good morning. Nice talk. Carolyn Kaplan from Atlanta. Hey. Hi. <laughs> um, so the best study, I was wondering what the implant, the twin rate was for the two embryo transfer I, versus the one single. Yeah. The twin rate was significantly higher. I don't know the exact statistic. I think it was around 20% um, from what I recall from reading it. But I, I think that begs into, you know, obviously that's why we had lower birth rate um, and NICU admissions for those patients. And it just, I think, is more data to support single embryo transfer. Yeah. So. That's what I was wondering about the NICU. Yeah. Um, how that compared with multiple. So the vast majority of that was because of twins? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All so. right. Thanks. But also, I think the other point of that study is that the biopsy itself is not producing poor outcomes, right? So a lot of people just, I mean, if you look at a video of PGTA biopsy, it's, it's a little scary. We're like pulling, you know, cells away from the placenta at a very early stage. And so I think it showed that we're not having, you know, you know, obstetrical poor outcomes from PGTA biopsied embryos. A great talk, Dr. Lewis. Um, Edward Duran from Pathways Fertility. Um, one thing that you didn't bring up <clears throat> when you talk about the, um, the two embryo study is that ASRM came out with guidelines about a year and a half ago, which is if you have a PGTA tested embryo, regardless of the patient's age, you can only transfer one embryo. Mm -hmm. And I have at least three to five patients a week come into my office and say, I want twins, I want a boy, I want a girl. You know, how do you counsel those patients? 
Yeah, so I think um, when I was first in practice, now I'm, I'm not a seasoned REI, but um, you know, my first year of practice, I had a patient who failed a euploid embryo transfer and then begged for a double embryo euploid transfer. I uh, gave them all the data, I counseled till I was blue in the face. We did, at the clinic I was at, we did do double embryo transfers. Um, and she delivered at 24 weeks. Her baby spent 100 days in the NICU with, um, they have blindness and, I mean, it's terrible. So I always tell my patients that story and I say, I'm not transferring two euploid embryos. Um, unless they failed multiple, multiple euploid embryo transfers, recurrent pregnancy loss, other things. So. Um, I say one embryo at a time. I say you can go to a colleague, you can get a second opinion who might transfer too, but I'm not gonna do it because I want healthy babies and healthy moms. So it, it is a big issue. I think patients struggling with infertility have no idea the increased risk of multiples. They've never been in a labor and delivery ward. They've never been in OBGYN residency. They don't see the complications that a lot of, you know, we see on a daily basis. So. Um, I adhere to those guidelines. I think most of my practitioners do as well. Any more oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay.